If you could choose anywhere in the world to be buried, if you could choose your cemetery, where would you choose it to be? You know, people have different ideas about that. Some people are obsessed about where they're going to be buried. Others, they really don't care that much. Several years ago, I was visiting with one of my good friends who was one of my former elders, and we were laughing about something that happened recently with he and his grandson. They were sitting on the back porch, and somehow the topic of death came up, more specifically burial. And so the grandfather asked his grandson, where would you like to be buried? And his grandson said, well, you know, I haven't thought about it that much, so why don't you surprise me? Why don't you surprise me? That's an interesting thought. Others, on the other hand, like I said, they're much more passionate about where they're going to be buried. Preston Crest, where I currently serve, is just a couple of miles from North Park Mall here in Dallas, Texas. And North Park, if you know anything about Dallas or anything about our malls, North Park is one of our upscale malls. It's a great place to visit. It's a great place to go shopping if you can afford it. And across the street from North Park Mall is an upscale funeral home and cemetery called Sparkman Hillcrest. And so recently I got on Sparkman Hillcrest website just to see how much one burial plot would be there at Sparkman Hillcrest. And on their website, it says that it's about $10,000. Now, they were running a special one day, and they said that this burial plot is right across the street from the North Park Mall. And I thought to myself, well, isn't that a great selling pitch? You know, if Neiman's or Nordstrom's has a sale in your afterlife, well, you can just go over there and buy anything you want. You can satisfy your heart's desire. I don't know if that helps sell you on a burial plot to be across North Park, to be across from North Park Mall, but for maybe some people it does. I heard another story about this man and his wife and they took his mother-in-law to Israel one summer because she always wanted to see the Holy Land. But then when they got over there, she tragically died. And so the son-in-law had to figure out, are we going to bury her here in Israel or are we going to fly her body back to the United States where we live? And so he went down to talk to a local funeral home there in Jerusalem and the funeral home director said, okay, well, we can bury her here in Jerusalem in Israel for $150, or it's going to cost you $20,000 to fly her back to the United States. You know, which one do you want to do? The man thought about it for a few moments, and he said, well, I guess I'll fly her back to the United States. And the funeral home director was confused. He said, did you not hear me? It'll cost you $150 to bury her here in Jerusalem or $20,000 to fly her back to the United States. Why would you choose the $20,000 option? The man said, well, you know, I heard that story about this man named Jesus who was buried here in Jerusalem. And three days later, he came back to life, and I can't take that kind of risk. Okay, maybe that's not the kindest joke, but again, you get the idea. For some people, where they're going to be buried, not that big of a deal. For others, it's a really big deal. So if you could choose your cemetery, if you could choose where you're going to be buried, what would you choose? You may be saying, man, that sounds like a really morbid question. Maybe it is. But when it comes to matters of faith, I don't think it's that morbid of a question. In fact, I think it's a very important question. It's a question that people of faith have been asking for thousands of years. And Genesis chapter 50 illustrates for us why that question is so important. The great patriarch Jacob chose his cemetery. 
In fact, at least three different times in Scripture, specifically in the book of Genesis, we hear about Jacob's request for his final resting place. If we go to Genesis chapter 49 and verses 39 through 40, Jacob said these words to his son. He said, I am about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah near Mamre in Canaan, which Abraham bought. That sounds pretty specific. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephron, the Hittite, the cave in the field of Machpelah, near Mamre, in Canaan, which Abraham bought. Jacob knew where he wanted to be buried. And then in Genesis chapter 50, verse 5, Jacob dies. And Joseph remembers that final request of his father, and so he makes this request of Pharaoh. My father made me swear on oath and said, I'm about to die. So bury me in the tomb that I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. Let me go and bury my father. And Pharaoh graciously agrees to let Joseph have that right because Joseph is now the second most powerful man in the whole land of Egypt. But then if we go back to Genesis 47, verses 29 through 30, we see even again how specific Jacob was about his wishes for where he was going to be buried. The text says that when the time drew near for Israel to die, that's Jacob, he called for his son Joseph and said to him, If I have found favor in your eyes, put your hand under my thigh. Well, that's something every son wants to hear from his father. But put your hand under my thigh and promise me that you will show me kindness and faithfulness. And Joseph, here's how you're going to do that. Do not bury me in Egypt. But when I rest with my fathers, carry me out of Egypt. And bury me where they are buried. Joseph says, okay, Dad, got it. You don't want to be buried in Egypt. Jacob interrupts him and says, now, Joseph, listen to me. Promise me this. Put your hand under my thigh. Promise me that when I'm gone, you're not going to bury me here in this land of the pyramids. You're going to take me back to Canaan. Promise me that. Man, Jacob really didn't want to be buried in Egypt, did he? Now, why was that? Was that because Egypt was a bad place to be buried? Oh, quite the contrary. At this time in history, Egypt was the greatest nation in the world, the fanciest nation in the world, the wealthiest nation in the world. Jacob would have received a red carpet type of treatment because it's very clear from Genesis chapter 50 that because of his relationship to Joseph, his son, who is now the second most powerful man in Egypt, Jacob was very well respected. In fact, when Jacob did pass away, Egypt took 40 days to embalm him. That was something that only the wealthiest of the wealthy received. Jacob wasn't the wealthiest of the wealthy, but he received that special treatment. In fact, the entire nation of Egypt mourns Jacob's passing for 70 days. That's a pretty big deal considering the fact that they only mourned a Pharaoh's passing for 72 days. And then all of the great Egyptian dignitaries make the trip with Joseph and his brothers back to Canaan to bury their father, Jacob. I mean, we kind of see those types of things in our world today when a great 
public figure dies or a famous politician or a famous celebrity or some type of hero. There's all kinds of pomp and circumstance. Think about JFK's big day in Washington back in the 60s after he had been tragically assassinated here in Dallas, Texas. Or in more recent years, Princess Diana. Or even more recently, when President George H. Bush passed away just a couple of years ago. Can you remember the image of the trains going through Texas all the way to College Station, Texas, carrying his body? It was a big deal. Well, Jacob received this type of treatment. He was a who's who of Egypt. But Jacob did not want to be buried in Egypt. He wanted to be buried in Canaan. And there's only one reason why. Because Canaan was God's land. And Jacob believed that since Canaan was God's land, that's where Jacob belonged. You see, Jacob's decision about his cemetery was not a decision that was based on soil. Rather, it was a decision that was based on faith. And Jacob through faith, believed with all of his heart that one day God was going to redeem that land, that He was going to restore that land. And when that happened, that's where Jacob wanted to be. But it wasn't just Jacob who chose his cemetery. Jacob's son, Joseph, chose his cemetery as well. It's very clear that the father's strange desires and strange habits wore off onto the son. Because in Genesis chapter 50, verse 24, he sounds just like his father, and he says to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath and said that God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up from this place. That is Genesis chapter 50, verse 24. Now again, why does Joseph say that? Why does Joseph make his brothers promise, you're going to take my bones out of this place of Egypt? Was that because Egypt did not have nice cemeteries? Of course not. We've already covered that. And let's add one other layer to it. Joseph, unlike Jacob, Joseph is royalty. I mean, he would have received Pharaoh type of treatment. He may have even received a pyramid for his burial. But now Joseph says, don't let them do it. Don't let them bury me here. Put my bones in a box and take me with you. Which that really would have been challenging because after Joseph dies, as you know from biblical history, Israel endures 400 years of brutal Egyptian slavery. And the whole time, Joseph's bones are in a box with God's chosen people. Can you imagine the conversations with your grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Hey, Dad, what's in that box? Oh, that's Grandfather Joseph's bones. Why are we carrying around Joseph's bones? Well, because that's what Granddad wanted. He made us promise him that we'd take his bones with us. And your children walk off in the corner and they say, Wow, our family is so weird. Maybe so. But again, Joseph made a choice. And his choice was not based on practicality. His choice was based on faith. He told his brothers before he died, God's going to come to your aid. God's going to take you up out of this land just like he promised. And when you head for Canaan, when you head for that land that is flowing with milk 
and with honey. I want you to take me with you. I want to be buried there. And so I think that's why it's so incredibly special that after decades have passed and after Israel has finally crossed over into the Jordan, after 40 years of wandering, after 40 years of fighting, we read these words in Joshua chapter 24, verse 32. And Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried at Shechem. That promise was kept. So here's the deal. Jacob chose his cemetery, and Joseph chose his cemetery. But my question for you today is, what about you? Which cemetery do you choose? Oh, it's so easy to become entrenched and entangled by matters of this world, by matters of this country. It might be politics. Who's in office? Who's out of office? Who's going to win the election? Who's going to lose the election? Are we Republicans? Are we Democrats? Who's sitting on the bench of the Supreme Court? Who's making the votes in Congress? How do we get them into Congress? How do we get them out of Congress? Or maybe it's the virus. Should we wear a mask? Should we not wear a mask? Should we reopen? Should we remain closed? How long will this really go? Is this virus real or is it completely political? It may be the economy. Is it a bull market? Is it a bear market? Is it a good time to invest? Is it a bad time to invest? Are we going to have inflation? Are we going to have deflation? Where do I put my money if nothing's going to grow interest and nothing is secure? It might be a matter of time. Am I going to live long enough to see my children have children? Am I going to become a grandparent? Am I going to get to be a great-grandparent? And if I do become a grandparent or even a great-grandparent, am I going to be healthy? Am I going to be able to get down and play with my grandkids in the floor? Or am I going to spend every single day going to the doctor? Or what about my retirement? Will, will it last? Will I have enough money to live on? What about Social Security? Is it really going to be there? Have we paid into a system that's never going to pay us back, or can we depend on it? You pick the issue. It is so easy to be entrenched, entangled, to be held captive to the matters of not only this physical earth, but to this country of the United States. And while those matters are real concerns, you know what they do? They end up choosing our cemetery for us. And I promise you one thing. It is the wrong cemetery. Because rather than longing for our homeland, like Jacob and Joseph did with Canaan, we are so focused and we are so obsessed on matters of this land which is really no home for us at all. Rather, it's only the, th the things that we can see and touch right now. But church, we must remember that this world is not our home. Rather, we are just passing through. This is a temporary stop. For Jacob and for Joseph, Egypt was a temporary stop. Now, it was a nice stop. In fact, it was the best that the world had to offer. It had all of the bells. It had all of the whistles. But it still wasn't their home. And Jacob and Joseph made their descendants and their family promise them, you won't leave me here, but you'll take me back where I belong. And this wonderful country of the United States of America 
It's a temporary stop. Now, don't get me wrong. It's a great stop. And I love our country just like you love our country. I would say it's the greatest place in the world to live with our freedoms that we enjoy and with the hundreds and thousands of soldiers over the years who have gave their lives so we can enjoy those freedoms today. We have a democracy. We can work and earn ourselves a good living. But even this wonderful home, America the Beautiful, It's a temporary stop. It's not where we belong. We are called to choose a different cemetery. We are living in difficult times, and it's our sincere prayer that things will get better. But even if they don't, we have hope and we have peace. And God's word reminds us why. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3, verses 17 through 20. For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is their destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship, and for today's purpose, I want to borrow the word, our cemetery is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior From there, the Lord Jesus Christ. May we choose that cemetery. For in that place we will never die. But we will truly understand what it means to live. To Canaan's land, we're on our way. May God bless you.